All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into it. I'm so excited about our session um, tonight. Last session was really powerful. We had a lot of really great feedback from our last session, which was how to like how to reshape, restart your life, reset your life. And uh, we shared a few protocols, including assess, reorient and go and move. And so today our live session is how to know God for yourself. And I'm going to go ahead and start with a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to get into it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together and have this conversation. We want to know you. We want to really know you. And so just now, Father, I pray that your spirit would be in us, move through us, and just be with everyone who's joining us live and who will be watching this later, um, that they would know what it means to truly live in the reality of your presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so I want to just start off. Everyone, I need you all to pay close attention. I have my notes out here. I'm ready to learn. Uh, but I want to start off tonight with a quote that I would like to read from a from an author. And I came across this note um, online, and I just want to read it in y'all's hearing and uh, think about this. Because our theme today is how to know God for yourself. And this quote, the uh, this passage is entitled, On the Infinite Nature of Knowledge. And so I'm going to read in your hearing. Let us engage in an intellectual exercise that begins with asking this question. How much is there to know? Well, first of all, it is within the nature of the knower, the knowing, and the knowable that the realm of knowledge is necessarily infinite and therefore can always be more fully, fully known and yet never fully known by a finite knower. The knower is in a constant state of change so that the knower always comes to know whatever they know with new knowing. Additionally, the knower only ever knows anything in relation to other knowers who are always generating new data to be known, so that all individual knowing occurs communally. Knowledge is fundamentally relational. It is, then, evident that knowledge is not and never can be a fixed sum total of information but rather is dynamically expanding reality is a dynamically expanding reality in which each new action each free agent adds new information to the exponentially growing realm of knowledge that which may be known is a ceaselessly receding vanishing point on a horizon to which we can eternally approach but to which we can never catch up so then if the relationship between each individual knower, all other knowers, and the knowable is of such a nature that the realm of knowledge is infinitely expansive, the following must be true. There is no limit to our potential for intellectual growth, emotional development, and relational bliss. Our eternal life in fellowship with God and one another will forever generate new levels of ecstasy and awe. And that's an eternal life worth living. In short, we will never be bored, that's for sure. <laughs> and that quote was a was a that quote was written by Ty Gibson on June 14th, 2023 on a random Wednesday on Facebook. Like I was searching the the searching the internet and I was scrolling through Ty's Facebook for like so a quote on knowledge. And this is literally something that Ty just wrote on, on a random Wednesday. And it's like so deep it's and so much. incredible. It's a bit much, but the essence of it is fine. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's going to, we're going to share this with you guys. If you've registered for our, for our zoom, I'm going to share this with you all. Um, Angela, Ty, I have to say something about, about that. Yeah. Ty has sent me many texts or, or just, uh, you know, emails, but generally text, but also some emails and other messages. And I'm like, Ty, this is so good. This should be published. 
He just, it just, he's a writer. It just comes out of him and it comes out of him with a clarity and a beauty that is remarkable. And I loved what you just read. I, I think it was fantastic. Yeah. What I was think something? It, I think, what, I think yeah. what you just, I think what you just read should be a little simpler though. That was a bit that, so the, can I just, can I state what I was trying to say in, in like a sentence or two? That's, or that's what we're here for. We're here to, we're here to get into what you meant by that passage. Yeah, what you read there, that's called meditation. That, I learned, I learned um, from King David that we should meditate on God's law day and night. And sometimes things just dawn on you. And for me, the best way to achieve clarity is through writing. And so I write, you know, whatever pops into my head. And um, the essence of, of that, what, what you just read, is the idea that if God is infinite and we're finite, then we, approaching God, will grow forever. So we'll never, ever, heaven and the new heavens and the new earth won't be like standing at attention, strumming harps <laughs> for all eternity, saying things by rote over and over again that we don't understand. It will be, to quote an author, which I think this language, you all know this language, that eternal life is a ceaseless approaching to God. Mm -hmm. mm. This, is, this is the language used by Ellen White to describe what I was trying to encapsulate there. A ceaseless approaching to God. Yeah. It's just, I mean, what, a, what an eternity future, you guys. Yeah. What, yeah. I mean, what? We're just yeah. going to be always on the edge of our seat forever. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And this is the, this is the, the space where, that we're entering in with our conversation. I'm glad uh, it seems like folks in the comment are tracking and they're ready to get into this. Uh, David, do you have any thoughts really quickly on, on what, was, what was read? Anything that struck, struck you? Mm, first of all, I absolutely loved it. Second of all, I thought it was exceedingly clear and beautiful. And thirdly, I think my favorite part is, now I love the idea that Ty just communicated there about the ceaseless approaching God and ceaselessly approaching God and how God is infinitely uh, holy, infinitely beautiful, and therefore infinitely knowable. But I love the idea that free agents will be interacting, making decisions, launching enterprises, mm -hmm. learning new things, creating new whatever it is that's created, whether it's art or science or some combination thereof, and that that, is an, that itself is an increasing knowledge. Yeah. Think about like the books that I write, that I read, excuse me. The, the books that I read are books that other people wrote. And, mm -hmm. and when they wrote those books, when they had those thoughts, when they penned those ideas down, they added now to the sort of cumulative aggregate of things there are to know, to learn, to yeah. study, to yeah. appreciate. And yeah. that's not just something that's going to happen, you know, in the fallen earth. What I loved about what you wrote there, Ty, is that this will be an ongoing cascade of connection and interconnection and pollination and cross-pollination and new songs and poems and books and, and who knows what will be created, enterprises that we can scarcely imagine, and all of that will be increasing knowledge and it will forever mm. recede into the infinite horizon. And mm. uh, it's, I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. So as we, as we think about these humbling concepts, um, I want to frame the rest of our conversation around four questions. And um, you all can write these down if you want, but we'll, we'll go through them. But the first question that I want to um, ask in, in, the, in the context of what you both just shared, and that is this. If the realm of knowledge is infinite and never fully knowable, how can anyone know God exists? It's a good question. Well, first of all, well, are you, are you just start, I'm sorry. Are you just starting right into that? Are you? Why don't you read all the questions? That's helpful to my mind. I was going to, and then I was just like, okay, maybe okay, I go, should. go. Read all four okay. questions, and then we'll back up Thank to you. the first one. We'll do. That's what I did last time. I just kind of the question was just there. So it's question two: If God is love, why would He leave any room for doubt in Him? Question three. How can we differentiate between near, merely knowing about God and truly knowing God on a personal level, level? And question four, in what ways can we be more open to the witness of the Spirit in our daily lives? 
All right. So those are the four questions that we're going to be engaging in conversation around. And the first question, again, is if the realm of knowledge is infinite and never fully knowable, how can anyone know God exists? So if I'm just so humbled by this reality that even with all of this wealth of knowledge that humans have accumulated over the entire span of human history, and yet it's just a tiny little vapor compared to what is out there to be known, how can I even know that God exists? Ty, you start. Okay, so so you can know something in totality by its essence and yet understand that that essence is infinitely expandable. So 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 to know that God is love, for example, is to know everything there is to know about God in essence. And so anything that you discover after that will be an expansion of that one essential idea, that one essential concept, right? So I can know that God exists right now by the minuscule amount of knowledge that I have, and yet I can anticipate knowing more and more and more. I'm married to a girl named Sue, and this is just on the human plane, She's finite. I'm finite. And yet Sue and I have been together for many years and we're still getting to know each other. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? We're still getting to know each other. And we've been married for for decades. We've been together since we were teenagers and we're still getting to know each other. So you can get to know God forever and yet begin with the premise of absolute certainty that God does exist and God is good. Ty, I've heard you say um, many times that this idea of knowing, especially when it comes to knowing God, that it takes in a, I think what I've heard you call a wider range of data. And yeah. that, that we're sometimes left to believe that, you know, you just sort of aggregate all the evidence and you pile it up, archaeological, manuscriptural, scientific, mm -hmm. historical, you pile it all up and you know, depending on your pile versus my pile, you know, you might be 97% sure that God is good and God is real. I might be 98%. Somebody else might be 90%. What do you mean when, when you talk about this idea that there's a wider range of data that faith, Christian faith, living faith takes in? Are we just left with, you know, you're 96, I'm 97, Angelo's 98. Is that how it works? I don't think so. I think that we, we're living in a in a time that is post enlightenment, post scientific revolution. So from, you know, approximately the 15th, 16th century forward, um, we've all been educated to think in a more narrow frame of knowing if you if you can't see it with your eyes, touch it with your hands, smell it with your nose, taste it with your tongue, it doesn't exist. Well, well, we've all been taught, everybody in the West, in Western culture has been taught that that's intelligent. It's very intelligent to not believe anything that does not present itself to the senses. But that's a, that's a narrower frame of, of reference. It's not a wider frame. So, so I, would, I would suggest, and I have experienced, that faith knows more, not less, and faith is not gullibility. Here, here's what faith is not. Faith is not believing something that, quite frankly, is unbelievable, but I'm so gullible that I'm going to go ahead and say, you know what? That makes no sense. It's completely irrational, but I'm going to go ahead and take a what they call a leap of faith, and I'm just going to believe something that, quite frankly, makes no sense. It doesn't appeal to my intellect. It doesn't appeal to my emotional nature. It doesn't appeal to my practical life. But I'm going to go ahead and just take a leap and gullibly believe what doesn't make any sense. I, I think what, what we experience as human beings is something like what, what Hebrews chapter 12 says, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith itself constitutes evidence, David, yes. Angelo. Yes. Faith itself is evident, evidence. Uh, we know things intrinsically to ourselves that nobody needs to teach us. We know that there is a difference between good and evil, right and wrong. We know that 
that we as human beings long for a quality of love that finds no satis perfectly satisfying match in this world, but does find perfectly satisfying approximations in this life, like a good marriage or a, a good parent-child relationship or a good friendship. The moment you taste with the tip of your tongue a good relationship, you are experiencing in micro what is macro to all of reality. Mm. And so, so faith knows more, not less. I know, I, know, I know more than my senses can apprehend. Yeah. I love the idea there that that the relationship that you have with Sue is a relationship that is whole in and of itself. And I want to return to this idea of marriage a little bit later, but that you, there's still room to grow in it. It's not static. It's elastic. And similarly, our uh, knowledge of God and our um, uh, confidence in his existence and in his goodness is not something that we believe merely based on an aggregation and accumulation of data points. It is because God, and we're going to get into this, Angelo, uh, the teaching of scripture is that God has revealed himself by his spirit, by Christ historically to the world. And the self-disclosure of God to not just human beings collectively, but the self-disclosure of God to individuals by his spirit, constitutes knowledge. We have to understand mm. that. And, and we have to make a hard distinction between belief based on evidence and knowledge based on ex experience or exposure. So here's a way that I can communicate this, back to the marriage illustration. My wife and I have been married for 25 years. I believe that she loves me. I, I have an enormous amount of data to suggest that she really does love me. I mean, I'm 99.99999% sure that she loves me. I've just seen so much evidence in so many different ways for so many years. There's just such a consistency and a constancy to her relational integrity toward me that I absolutely believe that she loves me. Okay, now watch this. But I know that I love her. Mm. You see the difference? I believe yeah. that she loves me based on an accumulation of data that is consistent. 99.999% um, sure. I know that I love her because my knowledge of my love for her is not external to me. It's internal to me. I know that I love her. I believe that she loves me. Similarly, with the self-disclosure of God, again, collectively and historically to human beings by God in Christ and in the Old Testament, but let's just sort of hone in on the incarnation. God has revealed himself in an uninventable, unmistakable amazingly beautiful way in Christ. And we have that historical record in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it could not have been invented. It could not have been... Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a story that, that no one could have written or would have written. That's number one. So we have the historical revelation of God in Christ. But number two, we have the individual revelation of God by His Spirit to every mm -hmm. person, right? And yes. we'll get into this a little bit later. But Romans chapter 8, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit and tells us that we are the sons and daughters of God. So... We, we need to make a distinction, I think an important one, between belief based on accumulating knowledge, mm. accumulate, accumulating evidence, and knowledge based on something that I know intuitively, incorrigibly, yeah. absolutely, and this is your point, Ty, about how this idea of faith, it takes in something bigger and broader than mere sort of empirical data points. No, God has disclosed himself collectively to human beings in Christ and to me individually by his spirit. And not just once, not just when I was saved or baptized 25 years ago, he continues to do it every day with a constancy, a beauty, even a, a whimsy that it is unmistakably the case that God is not only real, but that God is awesome. He's amazing. He's loving. He's kind. And this is not merely something that I believe. People say, do you believe that God exists? Well, no, I know that he exists. Yeah. And let me throw some scripture at this, Angelo, David. Check this out. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 essentially says that everybody knows intrinsically that God exists. And the only way to unknow it is what Paul calls to suppress the truth 
in unrighteousness. He says, what may be known of God is revealed to them. That is to all human beings universally. This is in chapter one of Romans. Paul essentially says in Romans chapter one, everybody knows that God exists by default, by default. And then you have to you, you have to suppress it. You have to kick against it. You have to push it away. You have to you have to deliberately perform in yourself a sabotage of the knowledge of God that has been erected in you by the living God. That's in chapter one. And then in chapter two, he goes a step further. He says, not only does everybody know God, everybody knows God and therefore everybody knows the difference between right and wrong, he says, this is amazing, you guys. He says in Romans chapter 2 that the law of God is inscribed in all human hearts in some sense. Yeah. It's intrinsic to our design. God made us in his image, and his law is a transcript of that image. And so, Paul is essentially saying, hey, if you just if you just pay attention to the activity of your heart, like if you're a five year old kid and somebody some other kid grabs your toy and and kicks you in the head and runs off with it, you will automatically say something like that's not fair. How do you know that's not fair? Right. You know, that's not fair. You know that a wrong was committed against you when your playmate kicked you in the head and took your thing and ran off with it. And you want justice. <laughs> so you tattletale, you go, you go tell the authorities, right? So this is at five years old. We'll take that up, up the scale to when you're a teenager and you're in school and you know that the bullying that is being conducted against, you know, some awkward kid in school that nobody likes and he's being put down and and bullied you know that that's wrong if you get on some public transportation as a 22 year old atheist you think you're an atheist and you're on you're on a subway and you see a you see a young healthy young man push aside a 99 year old woman who's frail and he pushes her aside to take the only seat you know you have like indignation in your heart toward that young, healthy man that just pushed aside the 99-year-old woman. You know what he did was wrong. Nobody needs to even instruct you in these things, right? You might have, you might, you might come to know scripture later on in life, but you, God already told you things, taught you things. You already know that God exists. And you already know that there is something called right and something called wrong. And you know that you yourself are implicated in the wrong and you're uncomfortable with the things that you've done wrong. And you would like to somehow get out of that guilt by some means that you haven't yet discovered. You know all of this already. So, based on that, based on what you just shared, Ty, that it, it's interesting because it it kind of helps me to frame the next question. So the second question is, if God is love, why would he leave room for doubt in him? So so you shared this idea that we all intrinsically know that God exists and we have the law inscribed in our hearts. And yet because we live in a fallen world, it, it seems as if some people are are better set up to believe in God than other people based on culture or life experiences. Um, and so the question then is, if God is love, why would he leave room for doubt in him? And I think maybe where we're going with this is that part of the reason God allows for doubt in him is because the picture that the devil wants to paint about God, that most that the majority of religious systems paint about God, is a picture that should be doubted. But let's talk a little bit about this idea of why wouldn't God... I mean, so in Romans chapter 1, it feels like, okay, there's this kind of intrinsic nature, there's this implicit uh, kind of understanding inside of all of us that God exists. But why doesn't God just become more explicit about his existence? Why does he leave this room for doubt and for unbelief? Well, I would say if there's, if there's no room for doubt, there's no room for me. Mm. I have to be able to ask questions in order to exercise my free will at the intellectual level. If, if, if there's no room for doubt, then my only alternative is slavery. I have to be able to ask questions. 
when you read, let me come at this from a slightly different angle. When you read Paul's summary that, that Ty articulated in Romans 1, Paul's punchline is basically that man's ignorance of God or alleged or ostensible ignorance of God is not actual. It's imaginary. Mm. Uh, that, that, that his, his point, basically, it, he uses the language of who knowing the, 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 the judgment of God. And he says things like they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Like, like Paul mm. doesn't believe for a moment that, that God's, that God has not, to use your language, Angelo, explicitly manifested himself historically and individually. Okay, so there's that. But Paul's critique is, is very much like the psalmist's critique in Psalm 14, when he says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, just listen to this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, listen to God's evaluation of the claim, there is no God. The evaluation is not an evidentiary evaluation or an empirical evaluation. It's a moral evaluation. Listen, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. By the way, Paul's going to quote this in the early chapters of Romans. David, tell them where you're quoting from. Um, Psalm 14. Sorry, Psalm 14, verse 1. Now verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now, Paul's going to quote this in Romans 3. But but notice that that the point that the psalmist makes is that mm. God is unpersuaded by our ostensible unbelief. Our unbelief is born not of a lack of knowledge or availability or explicitness. Uh, mm. Our unbelief is rooted entirely in moral corruption. That's it. Yes. <laughs> uh, we, we, I mean, somebody's going to be God. Either God is going to be God or we're going to be God. I mean, this is the original sin there in the Garden of Eden, right? You should be as God's knowing good and evil. So when people dethrone God, even if it's for, you know, scientific reasons, atheistic reasons, so-called rational reasons, somebody is still in charge. And, the, and you know, invariably the person that's in charge is them, right? And they become God. And so God looks down not with, a, you know, not with the mockery of, of derision or cruelty or contempt, but he looks down with the, with the mockery of amusement that, that someone would claim to believe that there is not sufficient knowledge or explicit knowledge of God when God knows good and well that he has revealed himself not only historically in the various miracles of the Old Testament, not only incarnationally in Christ, not only individually by the Spirit, that every person knows that there yeah. is a God, that there is good, that there is right, that there is justice, as Ty was alluding to, that there is judgment. This is the point that Paul makes in Romans 1. And God's critique of this claim that, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not persuaded, there's not enough evidence, I've never seen God. God's critique of that claim is that it's a moral claim, not an evidentiary claim. And so it's very important to hold that, the, the biblical perspective, and, and this is not to say that every atheist, every, you know, unbeliever is, uh, uh, you know, uh, secretly harboring sin. Um, that's not my evaluation to make. This isn't David's critique of atheists and unbelievers. This is God's evaluation mm. of atheists and unbelievers. God says, come on, come on. We know. I mean, we know. We know that you know. And <laughs> yeah. you know, we know, we, you know. We know what's going that. on here. <laughs> yeah. And so I just want to make the point there that God's critique is moral, not primarily intellectual. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Back to back to the intellectual part. Um once you step inside the realm of acknowledging your knowledge of God, acknowledging belief in God, even within those parameters, you're going to be working out your faith and perfecting its perception of the character of God and yourself in relation to God. And it's perfectly understandable. For example, let me, let me give an example. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody recently who is uh, struggling intellectually with the existence of, of suffering, specifically the, the fact that children suffer in the world, mm. right? So children do suffer. People suffer in the world. And this person essentially was saying to me, is God big enough for me to throw my questions at him? And my answer was, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, if there's anybody you should be throwing this question at, <laughs> if there's anybody you should be throwing this question at, it's God. Yeah. And he is big enough to handle your questions. You are perfectly within the legitimate parameters of reverence. Just read the Psalms. Listen, listen to how David is processing his experience with God. He's like, God, all this suffering is going on in the world. How could you possibly, where are you? How long are you going to let this go on and on and on? I think you should intervene right now. Why aren't you intervening? What's going on, God? So, 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 so God is big enough to handle our, our questions, our doubts, our pushback, our tears, our anger. If, 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 if you've been through something hard or you know somebody you love has been through something hard, the best thing you can do is take your anger and your rage to God and say, God, this makes me very angry. Where were you? Why didn't you intervene? Why did you allow that to happen? And let yourself process your anger in relationship with God, not in unbelief or rebellion against God. God can handle your hot prayers. God can handle your tears. God can handle you stomping your foot and feeling really confused. After all, you are a finite creature. How can you not be confused sometimes? Take a look at yourself. You're silly. You're ridiculous. Of course, you're going to be confused sometimes. And okay. God can handle it. All right. I Okay. This is such good stuff. So I want to take a couple things that you guys have said and, and kind of lead into the next part of our of our um, conversation here. So I love what you said, David, where you're basically describing that the evidence of God's existence, according to Scripture, is fundamentally moral. And and then you you Ty talked about kind of this this concept about um, how we have experienced moral injury in our life. Um, this is why I think in Matthew 18, Jesus said, woe to those who cause a child to stumble. Uh, because when we experience moral injury, what it does is it kind of, it, in it existentially and emotionally, it puts us against God. It creates an enemy out of God, someone to be feared, not to, not, not someone who I can go to with all of my big feelings. And so what we have is we're living in a world in which each and every one of us has experienced a degree of moral injury, whether it was given to us by the piece of people who were responsible to care for us, whether it was our own decisions. And now what we're experiencing is these existential crises that sometimes we attribute to like an intellectual struggle with the existence of God, but in many respects are an emotional struggle because I may have come to a place where intellectually I believe that God existed, but I could never connect that knowledge to anything in my personal experience. And I worked with college students for many years as a chaplain, and I would have students come up to me and say, this is the last time you're going to see me at church because I don't believe in God anymore. And I would have those conversations with them. And the vast majority of students who would come up to me and tell me that they were leaving their faith had very little to do with an apologetic that they didn't find satisfying. And it had more to do with an experience that they could not connect to what they were taught uh, to believe. And so the knowledge was there, but the knowledge wasn't there. They didn't know God in, at an emotional level that allowed them when those big questions came to actually go to God with those questions about human suffering and abuse and pain. But because they only understood God at an intellectual level, they were left to their own devices to try and deal with the emotional ramifications of the reality of like a really messed up world. And so because they couldn't come to God with it, because of, because of whatever that experience they had um, growing up, they were not taught how to do so. They found themselves easier to leave God and leave belief in him than to continue in this kind of dichotomy of like an intellectual knowledge, but an experiential atheism. And so that leads to the next question, which is question number three. Well, before you go, was, well, before you go to yeah. number three, I just want to summarize that one of the things we're trying to communicate right now, I think, is that God has given enough evidence to believe and enough ambiguity to not believe. And what this does is, is plausible Leaving room for plausible doubt leaves room for my free will. And put it, let me put it to you this way. 
if I don't want to believe in God, I don't have to. I, I will be greatly disadvantaged in life, in all of my relationships, and for all eternity. But I don't have to believe in God. But God has given sufficient evidence that my belief in God is rational. It's not gullibility. It's completely, it's the highest form of rationality to believe in the obvious. And what's the obvious? The obvious is that there is more to reality than meets the eye and that we are something more than mere evolving animals that eat and copulate and that's the end of it and we turn to compost. We have stuff pulsating inside of us for righteousness and justice and love and empathy and kindness and goodness. And we long for stuff that doesn't find any satisfying match in the atheist worldview. So it's the most rational thing in the world to believe in the existence of God. Ty, Ty I have heard you talk in the past about this interview. That This just reminded me with um, Carl Jung. Uh, you know, the mm. great uh, seminal, uh, you know, psychologist, founder of, you know, the Jungian school of, of psychoanalytical uh, thought. And he did like a television interview or something. Yeah. And it was, d d d yeah. When he was an elderly man at the end of his life, because uh, he was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and Freud was an atheist and and they had a falling out because Jung was a a quasi Christian in process um, he, he wouldn't have had a similar faith to, you know, intellectual faith to what we have early on. But as he grew older and became an old man, the interviewer said, Hey, you know, you said you used to believe in God. Do you still believe in God? And he, he looked, he looked at the, the interviewer and he said, no, I, I, I don't believe. I know, I know, <laughs> I know God, I know God. So he, 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 he was on to what the scripture testifies to that we're looking at you know, on our time together tonight, you can know and believe. And I would suggest that what we're discovering is that, is that faith is a very high form of knowing. It's not, it doesn't mitigate against knowing. My faith is very rational, intellectual, and it takes into account more, a wider frame of knowledge than the materialistic view takes into account. Actually, the materialistic worldview is, is, is actually limiting its frame of knowledge. It's denying whole bodies of knowledge. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so good. I like what Lucy said here. She said, I think for me, doubting has produced more intimacy with God because I had to admit that I didn't already know it all or that I wasn't okay. It left room for him to do something for me. Doubt was the invitation to him. Oof, that was so good. Love that. Okay, so um, so let's go to question number three, which says, how can we differentiate between merely knowing about God and truly knowing God on a personal level? Um, and so, so now we're going to kind of make this differentiation. So, what is this? What is this kind of higher knowing that we're talking about here? Be, like that is not just about God, but truly knowing Him. On a personal well, level, it's, that it's, changes this. It's the knowing of living together, doing life together. Mm. It's the knowing of experience. It's it's not just the knowing of the kind of information or data that you might need to pass a test, uh, you know, a, a theological test. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I, I think we should know our Bibles and we should know our history, and this is all fine and good. But uh, there's this incredible interaction that takes place in John chapter six, right, where Jesus, uh, these large crowds are following Jesus. This is after he's, you know, uh, fed the uh, people with the uh, loaves and the, the fishes and, and thousands have been fed and Jesus' popularity is on the increase. And Jesus recognizes that this is all going seemingly very well, but it's actually going contrary to what has been revealed to him. And that he's not there to be the king. He's not there to win a popularity contest. And so Jesus does something very uh, mysterious and yet highly strategic. And that is he's trying to cut back on the number of people that are following him at this early point in his ministry, because he knows that many of the people that are following him are following, following him for the wrong reasons. And so in John chapter six, Jesus goes into the synagogue and he starts saying these like really, especially to a Jewish ear, offensive things. 
He starts saying things like, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, we need to remind ourselves that the, the Jews would not even eat animal blood. Uh, you know, th 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 this was highly offensive, and it was seemingly suggestive of a kind of cannibalism. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, we know that our Catholic friends are going to argue here for, you know, Jesus suggesting something analogous to transubstantiation, but that's not the point that Jesus is making. What Jesus is saying is you have to ingest, he's using language that is purposefully provocative and offensive, so that people will frankly misunderstand what he's saying and leave him alone. He's trying to, mm. he's trying to call the crowds. And people are like, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Uh, this is not exactly the rah-rah speech that they were looking for from a military political messiah. And so many begin to go away. This is the end of John chapter 6. Jesus then turns his attention to the 12, and he says to, the, to Peter and the others, um, will you also go away? Right? Will you also go away? And this is where Peter says famously, uh, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then this key line here, I think it's in verse 68. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, this is an important point. We have come to believe based on, again, an accumulation, an aggregation of evidence. You know, they've heard the teachings. They've seen the miracles. They've walked with Jesus. Like the data pool is growing. So you say, oh, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, just hold on to this. Moving away from John chapter 6 for a moment, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples, this is one of the most famous encounters uh, between Jesus and his disciples, and he says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're one of the prophets, some say you're Elijah. Jesus then says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up on behalf of the others and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus' response to Peter's affirmation of his messianic identity is remarkable. What he says is, no one taught you that. Uh, Literally, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, you don't know that from the rabbis. You, nobody taught you that. Uh, this has been revealed to you by God through his Spirit. It is uh, the self-disclosure of God, the ubiquitous available, knowable, accessible yeah. God to you, Peter, and you don't merely believe this based on an accumulation of evidence. You uh -huh. know that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's why he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no one taught you that. Yeah. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. So when you put these two passages together, John chapter 6, we have come to believe and to know, and Matthew chapter 16, who do people say that I am? Well, you're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. No one taught you that. Okay, now we're getting down to the brass tacks of, of, of the answer to your question, Angelo, which is, what's the difference between merely knowing about God, in other words, getting the right you know, answers on the test, and knowing God? Okay, mm. knowing God is what takes place when we open ourselves to the available, ubiquitous, inescapable revelation, the self-disclosure of God, not only historically, but individually to David Asherick, to Angelo Grasso, to Ty Gibson, and to every person on earth. And once we open ourselves up to that, we now know something, watch this, that we can't unknow. We can deny it. We can, to use the words of Paul in Romans 1, we can suppress it, but we can't ever actually unknow what we know. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's incredible. This is the truth. Yeah. This is the truth about the nature of knowledge, Ty, that we not we don't merely believe that God is good and that Jesus is the Messiah. We know it because of the self-disclosure of God by his spirit to our spirit. And yeah. the, the 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 primary thing that God's spirit says to us, according to Paul, is that we are God's sons and daughters. God says to mm -hmm. David Asherick, mm -hmm. You are my son, and I am your father. God says to Ty Gibson, you are my son, and I am your father. God says to Angelo Grasso, you are my son, and I am your father. And to the degree that we receive that, believe that, and live into that, we are living in the truth. And to the degree that we do not receive it, believe it, and live into it, we are living and believing the lie. Hmm.
Incredible. I just want to quickly, Angelo, can yeah, I? before you do that, let me just read what Jeremy said. He said, this is such a great discussion for me as someone who has recently returned to my walk with God, Woo! not feeling guilty Praise about God, openly Jeremy. questioning God, but the, but the direction he is leading. Jeremy, we're glad you're here. Uh, Amen. Hear it. All right, go ahead, Ty. Okay, so, so yeah, I just want to hang out. <laughs> With everything that David was just pulling out of John chapter 6 and Matthew 16, um, I, I want to, before I jump into what I want to lay on top of that, it, complimentary, I want to encourage everybody here that you're spending this time with us and we're spending this time with you, but would you just write down John 6 and Matthew 16 and, and really process what David was just sharing? Because, because the experience... That, that the disciples had and the experience that, that Peter had, it, it's, it can be your experience. Yeah. You, you, you can know, <laughs> you can know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and by logical extension that you in Christ are God's son, are God's daughter. You can know. Write those passages down, people. Look at this stuff for yourself. We're just testifying is all we're doing. We're just telling you what our experience is and what we see in Scripture. Okay, so I want to throw something on top of this. Okay, this is, so, so you're asking the question, um, how can we differentiate between knowing about God and knowing God on a personal level? Okay, the Apostle Paul does so, something really fascinating with knowledge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, that one is known by God. Okay, so here, here's, here's what Paul is doing here. This is amazing. Paul joins together knowing and love. And he, he essentially says that, that love is, is the highest form of knowing. So, so think, think about it this way. I can be a professor in a university teaching a theology class, right? And it's an academic subject. And, and in that setting, in that sense, God is a topic like biology or physics. God is a topic. But the moment God reveals himself to me, personally, and in the light of his love for me, I love him back. The moment that I say yes to his love, which is to love him back, now I know, now I know right. on a level that is extraordinary, and that level is the level of love. Now, there's two scriptures that, that, that I want to put on the table, because I think, I think Paul got this from Jesus. Mm. Okay, and it's in John 17. And I just, I just want to throw on the table where I think Paul, likely this is the source of Paul's thinking about how he conflates love and knowledge. And, and Jesus is praying to the Father in John chapter 17. He says in verse 3, he says to the Father in prayer, he, he says, this is eternal life, that they might know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay, so point number one, before we go on there, Jesus says that eternal life is defined by knowing God in the present tense. This is why, by the way, and we'll look at this later on, I hope that we'll look at this, this is why eternal life is a present tense phenomenon for the believer. It's not, it's not just a future tense thing that you get when this mortal shall put on immortality. So, 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 so Jesus says eternal life is to know God. That's verse three. Well, then he goes through his prayer and he says, father, uh, for all eternity past, you were loving me and I was loving you and, and, and you love them as you love me, which is phenomenal in and of itself. The idea that, that, that God, the father loves David Asherick and Angelo Grasso and Ty Gibson with the same kind and quality of love that he loves Jesus? Is it, Father, you have loved them as you have loved me. And then Jesus says in the final two verses of John chapter 17, he loops back to the eternal life idea 
which he began in verse 3, and he closes up the prayer, and he says this, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, by which he doesn't mean the world does not have data or facts or figures. He means that the world doesn't know the Father the way you know someone when you love them. Okay? The Pharisees know God factually. What, what, is, what is James says that the devils believe and tremble? They know, they know God factually, but not experientially. So Jesus says, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these, my disciples, have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, your character, who you are, and I will declare it that or so that in order that the love with which you, Father, have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus just looped all the way back and he clearly here defines eternal life in terms of knowing God. Eternal life equals knowing God and knowing God equals loving God. To love God is to know God, and to know God is to live forever. That's, that's what Jesus essentially says here. So Paul comes along later on, and he says, if you think you know anything on a purely intellectual level, if, you, if you're just high on the fumes of your academic prowess, if you think you know things, you don't know anything until you're in love with God. Mm. Then you really know. Then you really know. You know even not just on the human divine level, but you guys, you know this. You don't even know a human being really until you love them. Mm -hmm. When you begin to love somebody, you know them in a way that you don't know others. I mean, I know my daughters and my son in a way that I don't know all the other daughters and sons in the world of other people. Mm. So eternal life is to know God and to know God is to love him. And that's why you can have it right now. In fact, we have it right now. I can feel it like pulsating inside of me. God's love through Jesus is inside of me. And that means I have eternal life right now. I'm in possession of it. Or it's in possession of me. Maybe it's more. more better. Happy. That's way better. Eternal, I like eternal that. Eternal life has me. <laughs> it's grabbed me. Amen. It, it, has, it has me in a heart lock. Come on. Oh, come on, Ty. A heart lock. Oh, I love it. <laughs> 10 out of 10. That's so good. And and David, um, you'd mentioned before this concept of the difference between knowing and showing. Can yeah. you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll bring two kind of ideas together here. The one that I talked about earlier with my wife and I, how I believe that she loves me based on evidence. I'm 99.999% sure because the locus of that is outside of me. It's in my wife. But my love for my wife, the locus of that is inside of me, right? This is why it's so important there in John 14 and John 17 that Paul was, or that, that Ty was just quoting, that, that he says, my father and I will make our home in you. The, 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 the locus of knowledge is internal to us, not external to us. So, so I want to bring two ideas together here. I believe that my wife loves me. I know that I love her. Okay. Now, I cannot I might not be able to show to someone else's absolute satisfaction what Ty just described there. For example, Ty just said, I can feel the pulsating love of God inside of me. It's got me in a heart lock. Well, imagine here, you know, person uh, Richard Dawkins uh, or any atheist that just insists, you know, rigidly and rapidly on skepticism. And if Richard Dawkins or his ilk say, I don't believe you, Ty, I, I don't believe you. I I've not had that experience. This is outside of the sort of, you know, scientific realm. We can't know it. We can't touch it. We can't taste it. We can't say it. I, I don't believe you. Okay. Now Ty and Richard Dawkins are at a bit of an impasse because all Ty can say is, well, I know what I know and I can't not know it. And I'm telling you the truth. And Dawkins might say, well, this is all entirely unpersuasive. It's irrational. It's unscientific. You're ridiculous. Say all kinds of pejoratives as he's want to do. Um, and now they're at an impasse because Ty's knowledge of something is not is not corroborated by or is not witnessed by or is not even particularly tied to his ability to show that thing to a skeptic's absolute satisfaction. 
So if, if a skeptic insists on skepticism and the believer says, no, no, trust me, mm. Jesus changed my life. The love of God is in me. I am a different person. I can feel and I know in some way intuitive, incorrigible inside of my soul that God is my father and I am his son. I'm sorry that I can't show that to you to your absolute satisfaction. But in fact, that's just the way that God has set the whole system up. Because if I could show it to you to your absolute satisfaction and thus rule out doubt and unbelief, this gets back to your third, uh, your second question, well, then belief on your part would be compulsory. But that's not the way it works. Wow. My, my, my ability to know something is not synonymous with my ability to show it to someone else's absolute satisfaction, especially a skeptic's. And so we can know a thing and not be able to show a thing, maybe because we're new in the faith or we're poor apologists or we're not good with our words or someone else is, you know, rapidly committed to their skepticism. And too often we conflate these ideas. We think, oh, no, if I can't convince somebody else, then I can't know it for myself. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Your ability to convince yeah. somebody else is in entirely independent, really, of your ability yes. to know something yourself <laughs> And this is what I mean by the difference between knowing intuitively, incorrigibly, by the self-disclosure of God through his spirit and your ability to show to some other person's absolute satisfaction. These things are related, but they are certainly not synonymous. Yeah, wow, thank you really for explain important. thank you for explaining that. That is that 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 does two things for me. I don't know what it does for everybody else. It does two things for me. Number one, it gives me a sense of relief. Mm -hmm. that that it's not all on me that god is going to be communicating to individuals on a level that i can't and number two it puts a a a, a, a healthy responsibility on me to raise my game <laughs> so i so i can so i can so i can so i can maybe articulate more clearly and be a better witness so i i, I think that's powerful what you just explained we want to be the best showers that we can yeah we, we want to, we want to show the love of God through our, the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we love, the way that we, we want, we want our historical arguments to be persuasive. We, we, we want to be the best showers of the love of God that we can, but, mm. but we shouldn't tie our ability to perform at showing the love of God, being an evangelist, being an apologist. We shouldn't tie that to my personal knowledge. Yeah. No, no. Jesus said mm. to Peter, no one taught you that. My Father mm. in heaven revealed that to you. And this yeah. is, of course, as we've alluded to already, this is Romans 8. The Spirit himself yeah, yeah. bears witness with mm. our spirit and tells us that we are the sons and daughters of God. Now, we should get better and better and better and better and more persuasive and creative and clever and, mm. and winsome at showing these things, especially to seekers and unbelievers. But yeah. ultimately, our ability to show is, is kind of beside the point. The yeah. knowing yeah. is the thing. Yeah, and for me, it also gives us permission to recognize that we go through seasons in life and sometimes we need to go through a season of kind of just silent growth. Sometimes we need to go through a season of putting ourselves out there and, and learning and, and, and all of us are in a different place in, in our journey, but regardless of what season we are in life, we can still know 100% that we belong to God, that we are his yeah. children. Amen. Um, so we're going to land this plane here. I, I think I've been left pretty speechless by a lot of what you guys have been saying. It's been so good. Uh, but question number four is this question. It says, in what ways can we be more open to the witness of the spirit in our daily lives? And we're referring to uh, Romans chapter eight. Um, in what ways can we be more open to the witness of the spirit in our daily lives? And so as we ask this question, we're going to also share with you three kind of principles or three kind of spiritual protocols. Um, but first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by the witness of the Spirit in our daily lives, according to Romans chapter 8. Okay, quickly, I'll say the Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Spirit is the living presence of God here on earth, available, ubiquitously, avail ubiquitously available since the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. The, Pente uh, the Spirit has not been taken back. The Spirit is here, is available, is, is, is disclosing to individuals the love of God, what Paul calls the spirit of adoption in Romans mm -hmm. 8. He says it's the spirit of adoption. We have not received the spirit of bondage to fear. We have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father, because the Spirit himself, mm -hmm. I'm quoting now from Romans 8, 15, mm -hmm. 16, 
17, that area, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. The Spirit comes into us and we cry out, Abba, Father. So that's what we mean, Angela. That's what we're talking about. It's what Jesus meant when he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Simon, son of Jonah. That God, by his spirit, and this is what we mean when we talk about the self-disclosure of God. God has revealed himself, and that constitutes not merely belief, but knowledge. God has shown himself to David Asherick. I know who God is in relationship to me, and by extension, who I am in relationship to God. He is my father, I am his son. This is the spirit of adoption. I know this. And furthermore, I'll just throw one little thing on the end of this. We, your, your question is, is how can we be open to the, the witness of the Spirit in our daily lives? The answer is, we live into this truth. Yes. We, we live into the truth that mm. we are God's sons and daughters and He is our Father. And I'll give you a good illustration. Uh, one that I've used uh, several times already. You know, I know that I love my wife. I believe that she loves me. Okay, so I'm 99.99999% sure that she loves me. But, but I don't keep a distance from her. I don't stand at arm's length from her. No, yeah. I live into her love for me. I, I believe that she loves me, and I live into that. I not only behave as though I love her, which is true, I behave as though she loves me. And in living into that, it becomes all the more real experientially, and I basically know I mean, as close as you can be to knowing that my wife loves me because we are, in fact, one flesh. And similarly, we live mm-hmm. into this great truth that God is our father and we are his sons and daughters. You believe it. Mm-hmm. You receive it. You live mm-hmm. into it. And it changes your life. It yeah. literally changes everything in your life. I want to read a portion of, of Romans chapter 8 that kind of talks about this. Obviously, an incredible chapter It says, he condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So essentially what he's saying there is Jesus has already condemned sin in the flesh. He's already won the battle for sin. Like sin's ruling power has already been destroyed on the earth. He's already bared witness in his, in our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. This is something, the victory's already been won. And then to live according to that truth means to walk, setting, set your minds on what the spirit has revealed not what the flesh is trying to reveal. I'll give you great language for that. You've, we've all heard the term, uh, fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. My, my good friend Jennifer Schwarzer, she came up with the phrase, which I love, faith it till you make it. Mm-hmm. Which we, we just, we live into this reality and before you know it, you are immersed in the the ubiquitous, inescapable love of God, and you know things that you cannot know in any other way, and mm-hmm. your ability to show that, again, to someone else's satisfaction is quite beside the point. You know a yeah. thing, and that is that mm-hmm. God is your father and you are his son or daughter. Yeah. And so here's 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 the point for that the take home for all of you. So we wanted to tell you that we we had three take homes or three protocols. We really only have one. So the one thing, the one practical take home message that we want for you all to do to write this down is we're calling you to live into the self-disclosure of God's love for you in three areas. So the one thing we're calling to you to do is to live into the self-disclosure of God's love for you. One, in the word, two, in nature, and three, in community. And so we're going to kind of we're going we're gonna to flesh those out a little bit. Uh, but Todd, do you have anything to add before we flesh those things out? I was just going to say that we should act like what we are in Christ. Right. So, so all the positive declarations of Scripture regarding our identity, we should just own them. You, 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 you are accepted in the beloved. You are more than a conqueror in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But you see what I'm saying, where I'm going with this, right? I, I, I am what the gospel says I am. I am, I am the child of God. 
I am forgiven, accepted, crucified, risen, and ascended in Christ. I am in Christ what I cannot ever be in and of myself. So just, 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 just care. Throw your shoulders back, lift your head, and say to the world and to the devil and to everybody around you, but not, you know, necessarily in these words, but with your posture and your attitude, I've got a good thing going on. God loves me. And I, I mean, Christ, I've got this incredible situation going for myself here. I am, I am in Christ, what I am not in myself. I am, a, I am more than conqueror. What, Ty, I just saw you blow it. I saw you fail. Ah, that was just a momentary little blip. I am... I am, I am in Christ what I cannot be in myself. Well, Ty, I, what, what was that that I just saw yesterday? Ah, that's nothing. Jesus forgave me for that. I'm moving on. Yeah, come on now. Come on now. Come yeah, on now. Love it. I love the shoulders so back, means- chin up. I love it. That's right. <laughs> so in light of that reality, we approach the word in this way. We live into the self-disclosure of God's love for us in the word by viewing the word with the lens of God's love for me. We recognize that all the promises of God are for me. We read the Bible as a child of God, not as a slave of God. And we recognize that not, I, you said something about, I love, therefore I am. What what did you mean? That was in our earlier discussion where, you know, the, the philosopher Descartes said, everybody's heard this phrase, it's come down to us through history. I think, therefore I am. Mm. And so I was suggesting that according to the gospel, I am loved, therefore I am. Yeah, yeah. So we're not approaching, what we're calling, what we're, what we're uh, challenging our community to do is to not approach scripture from a place of obligation or guilt or a sense of like, I must do this, but rather to recognize all of the promises in God are yes and amen for me. And so now I'm going to come to Scripture with that lens. I'm going to live into, I'm going to read into Scripture what I already know is true about myself. And so we we live into the self-disclosure of God's love for us in the Word. And two, we live into the self-disclosure of God's love for us in nature. David, tell us a little bit about why that's important. Well, there is reams of uh, data that shows that human beings just do really well in nature. It's good for us emotionally. It's good for us psychologically. It's good for us physically. When we are in nature, among the grass, the trees, the plains, the prairies, the mountains, the rivers, this is good for us. It's good for us on all the levels. And we need to prioritize in our own situation. Everybody's in a different situation. I happen to live in beautiful Colorado. Ty lives in beautiful Tennessee. I think you're in what? Northern Alabama there, Angelo? Northern Georgia. Northern Georgia, excuse me. We, we all have to, in our own spheres, in our own situation, we have to make time to expose ourselves to nature. You just have to do it. Like for me, that looks like hiking, backpacking, bird watching, rock climbing. Like I have my ways of being, sometimes trail running, cycling. Like we all have our ways of being in nature, but we've just got to see nature as God's love letter to us. You think about the eclipse that just recently happened, right? Like the the whole world was almost simultaneously in awe of that incredible cosmological event. And and we should be. There's a lot of study that shows that awe, uh, scientists have studied awe. Awe is very good for us. It's where we get the word awesome from. And when when the eclipse was seen, you get this Mm. sense of, scale of scope of size of sun and earth and moon and the interplay and it it says to all of us it screams to all of us that there is a mathematical precision to all of this it gets us outside of our smartphones and netflix and all of the things that seem so important but really are just banal and and meaningless and it gets us cosmically oriented and so we need to see nature as god's love letter to us. And we need to get out there. We need to spend time. You know, for me, I'm a big bird watcher. I strongly recommend that people become birders. It's it's great use of your time running, playing, f- sitting under a tree and just listening to the sounds. I mean, whatever it is for you, you've got to get out in nature and you've got to see nature in all of its grandeur, glory. And sometimes it's terror 
as an evidence of the goodness of God, the grandeur of God, and the awesomeness of God. Yeah, love it. I, I've told Ty this before. I I I do need trees for my mental health. Yeah, it's totally. It's a pra- practice that I that I did when I was living in in northern Florida. I would go for a walk on a trail um, behind my house, and I just kind of would always end up at one particular tree and. It was just an experience of just grounding myself in the reality of God's love for me. And one morning I was walking and there was a huge storm uh, the night before and uh, all these trees were down and I was turning the corner and I thought that my tree had been blown down by the storm <laughs> and I was I, I was almost heartbroken. But as I got closer, I recognized that the tree that I would constantly go to was still standing. And I literally broke down and cried. Um, it was just like, oh, it's going to be okay. You know, but there was there is this reality of, of stepping out into nature, spending that time, um, no matter how simple or mundane it might seem. Um, God speaks to us through nature. My, my grandmother was, by some people's accounts, a little strange in in this regard but but when we children uh, i had two younger brothers and a younger sister and we would be at my grandmother's house um in the summertime for periods of of time and and when there would be thunderstorms and it would rain hard um if it would start raining and we were in the house my grandmother would say there's a storm it's raining everybody outside (laughs) <laughs> Amen. We would just run outside and just feel the rain <laughs> on our bodies and the, as the puddles were were forming, you know, stomping in the puddles and playing in the and, and she was just she she just reveled as a grandma in the joy right. of these children running around outside and making a mess in the water and the mud and it was just incredible. She was a very cool person. I want to throw um a piece of scripture at this because because nature, David is what David is saying is just so crucial to to experience awe in nature, to go outside. But check this out: Scripture explicitly tells us that God talks to us through nature. In fact, in in fact, the Methodists used to call nature God's second book. I don't know if you guys know that. The, they used to call it the book of nature. There's the book of the Bible, and then there's the book of nature. Okay, and they got that idea from, from right here in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto, na- day, unto day show utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no language or speech where her voice is not heard. Mm. That's right. So nature transcends all, what are there, 260 languages or something in the world. And then there's one language, and that's the language of nature. Nature is linguistic. It communicates to us the glory, the character of God. Angela, you said something earlier about how a lot of people want God to be more explicit. It's not that God is insufficiently explicit. It's that people are insufficiently aware of how explicit and ubiquitous and available God is in Mm -hmm. nature, in history, in the word, by his spirit, in relationships. In fact, I think that's the third one you're going to get to, right? In relationships, living in to the disclosure of God, the self-disclosure of God in community. Yeah. What does that look like? What does that mean to to live into the self-disclosure of God's love for me in my relationships? How does that change? So you're on number three now? Yeah. Okay, so this one is really important, and everybody needs to... Okay, I want to say two things about it really quick, and and one is, that's what we're doing right now. Amen. That's what we're doing right this minute. You know, we're, 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 we're people getting together to cross-pollinate our witness about God, about Jesus, about the Spirit. And that cross-pollination, I know things with a greater clarity through fellowship with you, you guys. So, 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 so you, you, you utter a sentence, you make a point, and it plays off something in my mind that was put there two weeks ago by some other person that I was fellowshipping with. Right. So I, I, I received some knowledge 
And then you just said something that played on that knowledge and expanded it. And some pieces came together. And then like a chain link fence, it all starts building this amazing picture, right? So, so, so community, friendship, fellowship is vital for that reason, because, because knowledge is fundamentally communal. I can, I can know God with greater clarity through my friendship with you guys. Amen. If I'm left alone, if I'm left alone, I'm more prone to heresy. Correct. Yeah. And, and this is actually in, in, we didn't get into first John. We could spend a whole lot of time. Maybe we should do another session on this. Cause I feel like we've only scratched the surface. I, I don't know what the plan is for our next session, but maybe part two, Angelo, I'm just throwing that out there. Next because session I, is on love. So we could definitely, okay, get in good. There. We're going to have to pick up some of these same ideas because this is the very point that, that John makes in his, in his epistle, first John, where he talks about, our fellowship, the, the word there is such an important word, koinonia, our fellowship is with God and with his son and his fellowship is with us. And we want your fellowship to be with us because our fellowship is with God and with his son, Jesus. Yeah. This incredible thing that John is describing is that just as God is a covenant, God is a community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the church is a covenant community. And mm. we learn more about one another, more about ourselves, and more about God in community than we ever could in a monastic isolation. We yeah. have to be together. We have to be surrounded yeah. by yeah. God's people. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was praying when he was, when he was describing to know God, to love God is the highest form of knowledge. The, the, like the center of that prayer wasn't just that they would know you, God, and love you, but that they would love one another, that they would be one, because Jesus understood that there are going to be times when the only knowledge I'm going to be able to access from God is in the face of my brother and sister in Christ. And so he's recognizing this, that the degree to which we can learn to love one another and to engage in community we will have an ever-expanding picture of God's love for us. And, and C.S. Lewis um, gave this wonderful kind of story about how he had two best friends, and one of his best friends died. And he said, you would think that now that there's only two of us, that I would have more of my surviving friend to myself. But he said that now that my, our third friend has died, I don't have more of my second friend. I have less of him because there are certain aspects of his personality that only my other friend could bring out. And now that my other friend is gone, I have less of the guy who's, who's right there in front of me because I can't bring out the versions and the aspects and the humor in him that our other friend could bring out. And in the same way, God is like a beautiful prism and the degree to which we all view him from our own perspective and share that perspective with each other, we experience a higher knowledge of God that we would have never acquired just on our own. In isolation. Yeah. I mean, when the Bible says there in, in, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in the creation account, it is not good that man should be alone. It's not only a reference to Adam's partnership with Eve in matrimonial union. It's a, it's a, it's a statement about the nature of human beings. Yeah. We are not at our best alone in isolation. It's yeah. not good for us to be alone. We need to be yeah. together. It's good for us. It's good for others. And it's especially good in the disclosure, again, the self-disclosure of God by his spirit to ourselves, to our community, through the community itself. It's, it, yeah. And we could spend a lot of time going into how remarkable it is then that Jesus himself is now perpetually and wonderfully and uniquely a member of the human family. <laughs> yeah. There's a oh, heart oh, beating oh, on the throne of God. There's an now. actual heart. It's it's incredible. And so just just to give a short plug here, this is why we view our ministry as more than just um as more than just proclamation. We we believe that we are a community and and although this digital means of communication has its limits, um we believe that we are trying to help 
do the work of God by being some sort of a learning community for you, even though we're separated all across the world. And so I want to encourage you, we're going to continue to seek doing that. One of the things that we're doing as part of our Edify series is where we're We've created a private Facebook group. I don't know how many of you here are on the private Facebook group, but we have over 600 members now. People are joining from around the world, sharing testimonies and prayer requests. We love seeing those of you who are joining us. We're going to give you an opportunity to join that Facebook group. If you've registered for this event, there's going to be a link for you to join that private Facebook group. It's just one of the small ways in which we want to continue to help support community. Um, we know that there nothing compares to face-to-face -face community, um, which is why we continue to do our live events. And we just want to do our, p our part in contributing um, to helping you all feel seen, helping you all feel heard, and, and, and kind of encouraging each other. Because the truth is, just reading your comments and seeing all of you here, it's such an encouragement and it helps me to know God better. So we're just so glad that you all are here and part of this community. Um, so just to quickly recap, our call for you, our challenge for you is to live into the self-disclosure of God's love for you in the word, in nature, and in community. Um, do you all have any final thoughts before we go ahead and close tonight? That was, I loved it. I loved every second of it. And And by the way, if you have not already done so, you need to get this book, Steps to Christ, and you need to read chapter 12, which is called What to Do with Doubt. It's my favorite chapter mm. in the whole book, and many of the ideas, what to do with doubt, many of the ideas, I mean, big, amazing, incredible ideas about the nature of knowledge, the nature of faith, the nature of doubt, the nature of love, are so clearly and powerfully communicated mm. in that chapter, it should be read over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, if you look at my copy of it here, I mean, it's just marked up. It's just as marked up as can be. I mean, there is so much going on in this chapter. And if you haven't already done so, read What to Do with Doubt in the book Steps to Christ by Ellen White. Amen. I want to share with you guys a quick comment from Jackie. She said, there are people that I'm so angry at right now, but this makes me want to fight for a closer walk with those people specifically. Woo! If I don't, the enemy wins. I know I'm Praise not the only God, one feeling this way. Thank wow. you all so much. Thank you, Jackie, for saying that. We're going to pray for you. We encourage the community to pray for you as well. Um, so we just wanted to say thank you all again for joining us. Our next live session, the, the theme will be how to love what God loves and hate what God's, God hates. So that's interesting. You, know, you should love it, Ty. You came up with it. Oh, I so. did? Yeah. Yeah, I, I forgot. Okay. <laughs> that so. sounded like new life Angela, to me. Okay. It, it's, it's like the thing you read at the beginning. I imagine that if you hadn't told Ty in advance that he was the writer of that, he might not have even known. No, I read it to you guys before, and, and Ty was like, when did I write that? Where is that? How do you find that? <laughs> I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> So, Ty, can you pray for us as we, sure. as we close out our time tonight? Father in heaven, we want to pause and invite your spirit into our hearts to testify inside of us to the awesome reality that we are your children. Father, please don't leave us alone. There are so many obstacles and issues that we encounter in this life. Uh, we, we go through things that are just so mundane. We have jobs to do and bills to pay. And sometimes we have broken, strange relationships. And sometimes we're faced with health issues and pains in our body. And we get diagnosed with things that have to be tended to. There are so many things. There are lawns to be mowed and dishes to be washed and diapers to be changed and Life is just practical and real, and there are all kinds of things that we're navigating all the time. But Father, help us to not lose track of who we are in you and to change those diapers and wash those dishes and mow those lawns and go to that job and pay those bills with your spirit constantly testifying in us that we are your sons and daughters. May we never lose sight of the fact that we are walking with you out into the world inside of us. You are in us constantly, constantly reminding us who we are in Christ. Thank you that we are your sons and daughters in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We're so grateful you for this time together, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you all soon. Take care.
God bless. Bye-bye, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye.